Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As you know, it's just after 8.30 here in the United Kingdom. This is Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. Wherever you are joining us from around the world, a very warm welcome. We're broadcasting Sky Channel 752. We're across social media to handle British Muslim TV. We're across uh, the Middle East, uh, Europe, uh, in Africa, in Asia, wherever you are, a very warm welcome. Now, we want you to comment on the big stories we're covering tonight. You can call us now on 01924 231 or message us on the WhatsApp number, which is on the screen below. Now, if you're watching this on Facebook, post your comments in the chat box. We'll read some of them on air later. Tonight, first, we head to London to talk to Tariq Jamal, the founder of the popular social media app, The Pillars, about how social media is changing religious needs and requirements through a modern context. It's a fascinating insight. We then head to Iran and talk to the award-winning journalist Koresh Zibari about the Middle East being in t turmoil, t -mol, turmoil. Um, and inshallah, we then finish off in Glasgow and talk to the Tariq Mahmood. He's the founder of the Sufi Festival, which is happening in the city of Glasgow in July. So we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us on 01924-231-083. You can message us on British Muslim TV across social media. Alternatively, you can send us a WhatsApp message. The number is on your screen. Now, the questions we're considering tonight, how can we enhance our religious connections in a modern context? Does the Middle East require better relations between Iran and the Arab world? And the Sufi festival is back this year. What do you at home know about it? If anything, please share your thoughts on 01924-231-083. Messages on WhatsApp, post on social media, and we'll read some of the programs and comments throughout. Well, let me rephrase that. We'll read some of your comments throughout the program. Got there in the end. Let's get started on our first topic and guest. Now, in 2022, our smartphones are an essential tool which we use to carry out everyday activities like banking, shopping, watching movies, or being on social media. Now, from an Islamic perspective, previous Muslim apps have been accused of sharing their data with the U.S. military, who have deployed the apps to get user location data. Now, two U.K.-based students reacted to the data, uh, the data uproar by pledging to create a new app that would protect its users' data and use Twitter to engage Muslims about the name of the app and the type of things people wanted to see in the app. Now, Tariq Jamal is one of the duo who's uh, designed and delivered the app, and it's been downloaded over 20,000 times. I think that figure's gone up recently because I've downloaded it last week in preparation for this program, and actually I've, I really enjoyed it. It's great, it's great to have it on my phone. I'm pleased to say Tariq Jamal is joining us um, live, supposedly from London, but he's actually in uh, Istanbul in Turkey. Um, so, uh, yeah, if it shows London, he's actually in Turkey. But a very warm welcome to the program, uh, Tariq. Uh, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out from your busy schedule to join us here on British Muslim TV. That's fine. Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, tell us, where did the idea of the app come from? Yeah, so when the report came out uh, back in November 2020 uh, about the, the biggest prayer app at the time, Muslim Pro, um, selling user data to a third party, and that third party then selling data to the US military. Um, me and Abdul Rahman, my co-founder, we were in a group chat, um, and we were all just discussing it. We were all just so appalled uh, because the, the community's trust had been violated. Um, and me and Abdul Rahman, we have complementary skill sets. Uh, I study computer science, and so I have development experience. And Abdul Rahman has been involved in a few startups in the past doing design work. Um, and so we saw there was a clear need for a solution here. Um, and we just decided to build something and provide something to the community. And yeah. Alternative. yeah, because there was lots of protest. Um, you, you mentioned the app uh, over the data sharing with the US military. Now that particular app has denied uh, that they did that deliberately and they've cut, cut the relationship with the, the, the third party company uh, that they were using. What did you make of the impact? Because protecting one's data is very, very important to everybody. Because you don't want that um, data being shared, uh, you know, from a child protection point of view, but also from a safety point of view. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, when the report came out, um, we, we were obviously outraged. Uh, we, we both believe that everyone's entitled to their privacy um, and data protection is very important. And Muslims are no exception to that. Um, and I really did feel as if Muslims were targeted uh, by this. 
Uh, and, and so even if the company came out and said that it wasn't intentional and uh, that they didn't do this, uh, data, data protection is still very important. And that's why we committed to collecting no data whatsoever. Uh, we can't sell data, we can't leak data or anything if we don't connect, uh, collect it in the first place. Yeah, because let's talk a bit about social media and the Muslim social media, because, you know, lots of us are on social media. Uh, we have our experiences, you know, with, with the rest of society. But there is a vibrant Muslim social media. Tell us about your experience with it prior to the app. Sorry? Prior to the app. Ah, yes. Um, well, uh, there's, there's this thing known as Muslim Twitter, um, which is just uh, all of the Muslims on Twitter, I guess. Uh, and it's a nice community because uh, we all hear about the same sort of issues, uh, the same sort of, uh, the same news and everything. Um, and so it's good. There's, there's already a nice community there. Uh, and so when something like this report comes out, or everyone on Muslim Twitter, all of the Muslims on Twitter hear about it. Uh, and so it was nice when we started building the app and we started tweeting about it um, because the same people who had been affected and had seen that article uh, saw what we were doing and appreciated it. And we could use them to uh, help guide us in the, in the development of the app itself. Mm. And in a sense, when you look at the market, when you, when you certainly, uh, were, I'm assuming you're doing some research as you develop your thoughts and ideas on the app, uh, th th there is lots of other apps. Yeah. How do you make your app stand out from the rest of them? Well, there were a few different things uh, we came across in our research. Most prayer apps, uh, unfortunately, they were filled with ads. Uh, it, was, it wasn't uncommon to download a prayer app, open it to find the prayer times for that day, uh, and just be bombarded with ads, sometimes full screen ads that you can't skip, um, and sometimes even inappropriate ads. Like I remember seeing a few gambling ads uh, in different prayer apps when we, when we were doing our research. Uh, and so that, that was definitely something we wanted to avoid, which is why the app is completely ad free. Uh, and we have no intention of adding ads in the future at all. Um, and also, unfortunately, a lot of the, ad, uh, the apps that were on the market, um, despite saying that they would never sell data or anything like that, they still collected a lot more data than what felt necessary. Um, on the app store, at least on iOS, you can see exactly what the developer has access to. Um, and Alhamdulillah, our app, we, like on the app store, it says we collect nothing. Whereas other apps, it said that they had access to the user's location data, uh, their name, identifiable information, et cetera, et cetera. So that was another thing. And then also, unfortunately, a lot of the apps on the market didn't really um, seem well designed, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, I mean, Islamically, we have the concept of Islam where we need, to, we need to aspire to do the best in what we do. Um, and we felt as if the design of the apps on the market at the time didn't really meet that standard. And so we decided to provide something else. Um, and I, so I was telling my viewers earlier on, I downloaded the app to obviously prepare myself for this program, but actually I kept it on. Uh, you've got a Kibla app, which is really, really simple uh, and accurate, which is really, really important. Um, and, then, and, and then you've also got, and you can track your prayers as well, can't you? In terms of yeah. to make sure that, you know, if you, if you miss something or you're traveling or something and you need to make it up, it allows you to track that as well. Yeah, we, we actually added that relatively recently. Oh, did you? Uh, it wasn't available at launch, um, but we added it a few months after launch because quite a few people had requested it. And we did think it's quite important for a prayer app to have something like that. Um, we didn't want that app to just be as simple as, oh, you can find your prayer times and that's it. Uh, we want to really help people build the habit of praying on time. Um, and we'll continue to strive to do that, inshallah. And, and obviously the quick question would be, uh, where's your funding coming from this app? You're not charging, it's a free app. You're not doing what traditional uh, companies would do, which would be advertisements or selling the data and stuff like that. You've, you, 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 you're morally not going to do any of that. So where's the funding coming from this app? Alhamdulillah, we haven't needed funding at this point, um, up until now. Yeah. Uh, maybe in the future we'll need something. But as of yet, uh, the app itself is very cheap to run because we don't collect data. We don't have servers or anything. Everything's done on the user's device itself. Um, so there's no need for servers. Uh, the only costs we had were licensing fees um, for the app stores themselves. Uh, and me and our man were happy to pay that out of pocket. Yes, yeah, it's kind of a form of dawah, isn't it? You're giving yeah, something back. Because if I'm honest, and uh, I used to go, um, if I do a lot of traveling, so I, I'd literally go into... Uh, Google Gibla Finder, um, 
and since I've downloaded the app, I've not had a need to do that. And and it kind of um, you know, there's lots of steps you have to take until you get to your final version uh, and then be able to see where the Ghibli is. In your app, it's it, it, it it's amazing. You can just point in, you, you know it straight away. Alhamdulillah, yeah, that, that was a big focus for us. We wanted to make the experience as easy as possible for users. Uh, going back to the thing with other prayer apps, unfortunately, just having so many ads, so many extra, extra unnecessary features. Um, I don't want to call all of them unnecessary, but uh, we wanted to make the app not necessarily minimalistic, but just have the core features that people really want and really need. Yeah. Um, we're just coming up uh, to our break. Uh, you've also got the Azan at the time of prayers, and I've been comparing it um, to my local prayer timetable from the local mosque, and it's absolutely accurate. Um, how important is that, 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 that you are able to follow um, the pillar app, but get an accurate prayer time? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely important for people. Um, at the moment, as I mentioned, the app currently calculates prayer times on the device itself. However, certain mosques, especially in London, um, they don't necessarily use the exact location of the mosque to calculate prayer times. There's something known as the London Unified Prayer Times, um, which base their prayer times off of London Central Mosque and East London Mosque. And at the moment, if you're following that mosque timetable or a mosque that follows that timetable, uh, there might be a discrepancy of a, a few minutes. Um, and so we have methods in the app at the moment to sort of mitigate that. Users can uh, add like custom adjustments so that the app itself reflects, reflects uh, prayer times closer to their mosque. But in the future, something we do want to do is add actual mosque prayer timetables uh, so that users don't have to rely on calculations. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating discussion, and then we'll, we'll talk uh, a bit more about you and, and your bringing uh, and how you got to this point and, and what um, people can say. As you said, it's a free app available um, on Android, and it's available on the App Store as well. Uh, and so if you want to have a look, I do uh, recommend you do it. And it's a form of dawah as well. Uh, you're contributing uh, to that dawah as well. We'll take a very quick break. When we come back, uh, we'll continue the exclusive conversation with Tariq Jamal, who's the founder of the Pillars app, uh, joining us uh, live from Istanbul. Join us on the other side with these very important but short messages. Don't go anywhere. Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum. I told you it was going to be quick. Uh, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, live from our studios in Wakefield. We're taking your calls on 01924-231-083. Get in touch with us on social media. The handle is British Muslim TV. Now, we've got an exclusive conversation with Tariq Jamal, who is one of the founders of the Pillars app, uh, who's joining us uh, live from Istanbul. Now, uh, Tariq, just before the break, we talked about the need of the app and uh, really uh, the, the sense of where the funding is coming from and lessons learned from, uh, from your predecessors in the market. Tell us a bit about yourself, your bringing and, and what interests you in uh, wanting to do the uh, computer science and stuff that you did in terms of your degree. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in London um, and from a young age, I always had like an interest in problem solving um, and an interest in like mathematics and, and I guess computer science <laughs> once I was uh, exposed to it. Um, and I really felt as if computer science and software development was the perfect sort of uh, tool to provide solutions to things and the perfect sort of outlet for problem solving. Um, and I guess that just sort of naturally fed into building products and building apps. Uh, and so when the opportunity to build something like Pillars arose, uh, it was perfect, honestly, at Yeah. And how, how important uh, has uh, Islam been to your bringing and, and, and been practicing? Oh, it's been, it's been central, uh, alhamdulillah. Um, alhamdulillah. Central to everything. I mean, me and Abdul Rahman met through uh, Islamic societies at university. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been key for everything, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, and then you talk about um, it's really important um, that you're user-led and the fact that lots of the work that you do to engage your users is via Twitter and social media. How important is that interaction with your users? Oh, yeah, it's definitely very important. Um, one of the, the big issues with, again, like other prayer apps that were on the market is that uh, they weren't community-led. There was always this disconnect between um, the sort of consumers and this big company. Uh, and 
that, that didn't really feel right. It doesn't really feel sincere. And so whenever there's a complaint, whenever there are feature requests or anything, um, people often felt, and I've, I've definitely felt like this, as if they were just talking to uh, a blank wall uh, or talking to a brick wall. Uh, whereas me and Abdul Rahman, we've made the conscious decision to put our faces out there, uh, put ourselves out there, make sure that people can come to us directly rather than to some random company or whatever uh, about any queries, about any problems, about any feature requests, et cetera. Um, and also we've made sure that whenever me and Abdul Rahman have like a disagreement about where to go next with the app or what design looks better, uh, we polled Twitter and uh, we did that with the, the name of the app itself. We did it with a few different design choices and it's really been invaluable along the way. And what's the reaction been to the app launch you had last month? Uh, where are we in terms of the reaction and feedback that you've been getting? Yeah, Alhamdulillah, it's, it's been huge. It, it actually la uh, launched last year, not last month. Oh, right. I was assuming it was last month. Yeah, no. Um, and also, I, I, I think you mentioned earlier that it was 20,000 downloads. Alhamdulillah, we've managed to hit about 180,000 now. Um, <laughs> I, I, I knew I was uh, inaccurate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, blame the, the researchers the whole, for yeah. that. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. But um, Alhamdulillah, yes, yeah, it's, it's been really good. Um, it's been nice to see the support from the community. Uh, we see that people are passionate about that app and what we're trying to do with it. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's been really good, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And, and how do you see the, um, I suppose, the app develop? Um, because as great as the prayer times is, the Kipla is, uh, and you know, keep a record of your prayers, um, yeah. that's just not going to be enough, is it, as social media develops and apps develop and, and people's needs uh, want to be more where, where where do you expect to go next yeah so um there are a few different things uh, as i mentioned before we, we definitely want to implement mosque prayer times into the app uh just so that people can have that extra step of assurance that they are like getting the right times um but then also we want to have more calculation methods um as the app becomes more global people are starting to use it in other countries as well um, different countries have their own different calculation methods for prayer times so we need to include those also different languages um, we've currently got Turkish uh, by virtue of being in Turkey at the moment, uh, but we do definitely want to have Arabic, French, Spanish, etc. Uh, and also one of the things that we've wanted to do from the beginning of building the app, uh, as mentioned a bit with the when we were talking about the tracker, is we want to really help people build the habit of praying and praying on time. Um, and so inshallah in the near future, we want to sort of uh, implement habit formation techniques into the app, uh, such to, to help people build that habit, inshallah. Yeah. And then do you, do you see lectures, shop, you know, reminders, videos and stuff like that or text? Potentially. Um, maybe not in the near future, uh, but we'll see where it goes, inshallah. Yeah. And what, what do you do in terms of your career? Well, what's, are you, is this something you do on the side in between all the busy jobs you do during the day? Yeah. No, uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm a student at the moment. I'm wow. currently doing my master's. Uh, I've been doing uh, my degree alongside pillars and everything, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and other man, he was a medical student when it started, but he's actually just graduated and now he's doing his, his foundation year training. So this is sort of a, a side project for us at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I just find it's really important that, uh, that we develop these apps because lots of young people, particularly, you know, my children's generation who are in their late teens, uh, for them, their phone's everything. And they do everything on the phone. Um, and if they don't see an app that attracts them to the deen, then uh, we're missing a trick, aren't we? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, phones, they have this great capacity to, to be massive time wasters or amazing tools for good. Um, and I think the key to, to utilizing them for good is to provide these sorts of services. Um, because if there's nothing like this, then people just won't use it for good. Uh, they'll just waste their time doing something else. Uh, so while we've got this opportunity, we need to make use of it. Yeah, make use of it. So I mean, we talked about some of the other features. I mean, are you working closely with some of those mosques? Um, to see what their needs are and, and if that could be incorporated in, in, in the app. Yeah, so we definitely do want to do something like that in the future. We actually, um, shortly after launching, we had a few calls with a few different mosques, um, but the sort of conclusion we came to was that the app needs to grow first and it needs to be a bit more mature before we can actually partner with these mosques. Um, they just need that sort of assurance. Yeah, because, you know, a bit like uh, a lots of places of worship um, would use Facebook Live and, and other activity platforms uh, to broadcast uh, to their, uh, you, know, so, uh, you know, congregation. But when COVID hit, uh, lots of places of worship uh, weren't able, 
they weren't ready, they weren't able to do that broadcast. And wouldn't it be great to have an app where, you know, a mosque could broadcast and you could watch it on your phone by picking whichever mosque you wanted to and, and the mosque yeah. could connect. I, is that possible or is that just a resource intensive and, and expensive way to do things? No, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely possible. And if you could have an app that uh, is sort of your one-stop shop uh, or just a platform or um, almost like a social media platform, but not really social media, just a platform for different mosques, um, that, that would be amazing. And that is something that we do want to do. But as for whether or not it's feasible at the moment with our current skill set and what we need to get out of the way first yeah. in terms of features, uh, it would probably take a while before we can do something like that. Yeah. yeah. Because as I said, I, I downloaded it. I, I absolutely uh, love it. It's simple. As you said, there's no adverts. Um, I know my data is going to be secure uh, from a security point of view. So I know that, you know, nobody knows where I am. Um, and then uh, that, that's really, really important. Uh, what's the, what's the u users saying in terms of what they want to see next in terms of the app? Um, so lots of users saying that they want uh, more widgets. Um, lots of people want like an Apple Watch uh, sort of companion sort of thing to go along with it. Um, and then just a few different things, a few different like designs, uh, different themes, uh, different uh, alarm reciters. Um, yeah, standard things. We, we tend to get the, the same standard requests, um, but they're being worked on. <laughs> yeah. And what did you, what did you, um, you're obviously in Istanbul, so I'm assuming you're on holiday or you're uh, relaxing, but what do you do to relax? Is this something which constantly you're on the go and uh, having to keep yourself busy? As in, yeah, no, I'm, so I'm studying my master's at the moment. Um, so, oh, in Istanbul, yeah. Yeah, and, oh no, so actually I study at UCL. Okay. Um, but thanks to COVID, everything was online. Um, so I came here at some point last year on holiday. Uh, I was only meant to be here for 10 days, but I just really enjoyed it. And I made some good friends along the way. There's a nice Muslim community up here. So I kind of extended my stay and I ended up getting residency. Um, so 10 days turned into five months. Um, and yeah. Yeah, wow, I mean, that, that's kind of living your dream, isn't it? You suddenly <laughs> go, on your, you go on holiday and decide it's so great that you're going to stay there. Oh, yeah, it's, it's been an amazing opportunity, especially thanks to remote work. Yeah. Um, just being able to do remote things, things remotely is, is a great blessing. Yeah, and, and practicing the theme has become, uh, the theme has become easier. Uh, lots more people are reconnecting with their faith in Turkey uh, in yeah. recent times. That's, that's something really powerful as well, isn't it? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's a game changer being able to hear the Adhan outside uh, for every prayer, um, just having mosques locally. You need to come to Bradford. <laughs> yeah. We can get you a house next to one of the mosques that, and they'll call out the prayer for you. <laughs> definitely. Perhaps once I'm back in Charlotte. Yeah. I mean, what's the contest between Bradford and Istanbul? Um, UK Capital Culture 2025. Um, do you know what? I just just final question. What's your advice to, to young kids watching this who might want a career uh, in computer science? Might want to, you know, to do what you are doing. Um, I, I, you know, any career advice you got for them? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, just start building something. Even if you don't have the skill set, you'll learn the skills along the way. Um, that's the best way. Find a problem, try and think of a solution for it, and just try building that solution. Even if you don't manage to, you'll learn invaluable skills uh, in the process. Yeah, and there's plenty of career opportunities in this in this field. So if yes. you, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure, Tariq. Um, I hope you enjoy your rest of your time uh, in, in in Istanbul. But thank you so much, and best wishes to uh, Abdul Rahman and the whole team um, uh, uh, in the app as well. But as I said, you can download the app now. It's on um, it's on Apple Pay, uh, Store. And it's also on Android. But thank you so much. Uh, remembers in your presence. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. That was Tariq Jamal, uh, who is one of the founders of the Pillars app. As I said, you can get it now. Um, it's a free app. There is no advertisements. There is no data um, shared. There's no data collected. So it can't be shared. Um, and, and it's a really good, simple app. Just does what it says on the tin. Um, it'd be great to see uh, if you download it and you've got some feedback for us. Uh, we'd we'll love to go come back to this as the app develops. Um, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take a break in about under a minute. And then uh, we're going to head uh, to Tehran and talk to um, one of the country's most important uh, 
uh, journalist and broadcasters. His name is Kurish Zibari. Um, not just about Iran and what is happening in the Middle East um, in terms of the nuclear talks, but what impact uh, and what way can you see the Muslim world coming together and resolving their issues in a diplomatic uh, and non-violent way? And how do you deal with what's happening in the aftermath in Syria that is still ongoing uh, and Yemen as well? So lots of things to talk about. His name is Koresh Zibari. Uh, he is one of the most important uh, Iranian voices uh, in journalism and the media. He'll be joining us very, very shortly. We'll take a very quick break and then we'll be here again with our new topic and new guest, See you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. I told you that it was going to be quick. It was a very short break. Uh, thank you so much uh, to my previous guest, Tariq Jamal, for joining us. Again, if you download the app, let us know how you get on. Uh, you can tweet us at British Muslim TV. Uh, at British Muslim TV. Now, uh, we're going to take your calls as well on this issue, 01924 if you can get in touch with us on our social media handles. Now, when Iran and world powers agreed to a nuclear deal, it was expected to provide certainty and security for the wider Middle East. Iran um, had held on to its promises, and when President Donald Trump took office in 2017, he decided that the United States government would exit, which caused the deal to face collapse until President Joe Biden took office last year and negoti negotiations began again. Currently, those talks are paused with a real fear that the deal could collapse. Now, since the deal was struck, Israel and various Arab countries, including the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco and Sudan, have established relations and Iran is a common feature of such diplomatic coming together. So how is Iran seen in the Middle East? What now for the nuclear deal? And what is life like now for ordinary Iranians? Koresh Zibari is one of Iran's most successful journalists. He's based, um, uh, he, you know, he's based in Iran. He's got the Chevron Award from the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office here in the UK. He's currently a correspondent with the Hong Kong head, uh, Hong Kong headquartered uh, Asian Times, um, and he is actually not in Iran. He's actually in Turkey. Everybody seems to be in Turkey. I don't know why. But anyway, Koresh uh, Zibari, good evening. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know that the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, is there. Uh, Tariq Jamal, my previous guest, was there. You were also um, in, in, uh, in, in Turkey as well. A very warm welcome to the program. Great to have this conversation. Uh, hello, Mohammed. Thank you very much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be with you. Right, the pleasure is all mine, sir. Uh, first of all, let's look at your own personal story. You were born in the Iranian city of Rasht. Uh, what was that like growing up in the city? Yeah, uh, so Rasht is. Uh, Look at in northern Iran, it's close to the shores of the Caspian Sea and it's almost 500 kilometers north of Tehran. Um, so um, the city mostly thrives on uh, local industries and um, agriculture and uh, also, uh, well, um, there are um, uh, numerous uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, the city suffers from a, a deficiency of infrastructure and also in the recent years, uh, lack of investment. Um, I have uh, been based in Raj for most of my life and uh, was raised in, in a family of journalists um, and uh, started my career uh, there as a young journalist when I was uh, a high school student and have been contributing to a national and international publications ever since. So um, I have, as you mentioned, done a Chevron scholarship with the UK yeah. and Commonwealth Office and also recently completed the World Press Institute Fellowship with the University of St. Thomas. Yeah, and so where did that interest in journalism come from? Is it something from, from when you were younger that you wanted to become a journalist? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, uh, journalism has been a family profession handed down to me. Uh, um, because my parents were both journalists, they have been running a local weekly magazine in the city of Rash for more than three decades right now. And um, when I was born, uh, actually opened my eyes to rooms uh, filled with papers and uh, books. And so I was exposed to that environment and that nurtured the interest in me to become a journalist. Uh, I actually used to uh, frequent the newsroom of my father's paper, weekly magazine, and I interacted with um, uh, reporters and writers being there since I was a child. 
that kind of um, developed interest in the industry in me. And then um, I started writing um, a very brief and short articles, giving them to my father to proofread. And uh, eventually, when I was a high school student, I ended up being published with the majority of Iran's nationally circulated papers. Uh, in 2009, actually, I started my international career uh, contributing to uh, English language publications uh, overseas. Uh, after starting my undergraduate studies in English language and literature, that kind of opened my way to um, um, international journalism. I have been contributing to a number of online publications ever since. Since 2018, I started my career with Asia Times, which is headquartered in Hong Kong. Also contribute to foreign policy, the national interest, Al Monitor, Open Democracy, the New Arab, uh, Middle East Eye, and uh, many other publications that you might have heard of. So, um, and also at the same time, I, I uh, had a very successful um, time with uh, San Francisco headquartered Fair Observer, for which I conducted interviews with <clears throat> a number of world leaders, uh, politicians. Um, diplomats, public intellectuals, and also Nobel Prize laureates. So um, that's my story, but uh, it has been full of ups and downs and um, yeah. its own challenges. And uh, also um, because journalism in my part of the world is uh, always uh, imbued with uh, certain hardships. Um, I was just going right? to... Yeah, so I was just going to add about that you grew up at a time of great division. Um, towards Iran from the international community. Uh, what do you remember uh, of, of that time and, and the uh, environment in which that division existed? Uh, that's correct. Uh, unfortunately, Iran has been uh, through a very uh, turbulent time in the recent um, at least couple of decades. Um, we have had the ongoing controversy over Iran's nuclear program. Um, Iranians have been living with uh, draconian and Herculean international sanctions for decades now that has drained the resources, that has undermined the country's ability to sustain itself, the economy, I should say, is in tatters. Um, people's ability to uh, meet their day-to-day -day needs has been hampered substantially. And uh, I have uh, first-hand experiences with uh, how sanctions have actually impacted my life and that of my family members, uh, whether it's uh, our ability to access medicine or our ability to travel internationally or um, to educational opportunities or a range of other um, problems that even might not be conceivable for people in other countries who are living normal uh, routine lives uh, because they are not influenced. I mean, their lives are not uh, hampered by these kind of restrictions and punitive measures. Uh, at the same time, there is ongoing tension between Iran and uh, the outside world over a number of sticking points, Iran's role in the Middle East, um, and also um, its regional ambitions and its uh, um, military uh, involvement in a, uh, in a number of countries in the Middle East, Persian Gulf region, ranging from um, Iraq, Afghanistan, and also further in uh, Lebanon, Yemen, and elsewhere. So all of these uh, complexities together have rendered Iran's foreign policy, foreign relations, and its uh, standing in the world a very shaky and uh, vulnerable one, which is at the same time uh, uh, having a toll on the ordinary yeah. civilians' um, quality of life and a standard of living. Yeah. That, and 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 but the, the, isn't the reality um, that the system since 1979 has been pretty resistant and strong? Wouldn't you agree? Compared to other Muslim countries, you've had lots of stability as well, despite the isolation from the international community. That's correct. Uh, I mean, um, Iran uh, is pretty much a stable country. There is no uh, active conflict going on. Um, there is no domestic conflict, even though I should say there are domestic divisions, um, but there are no ethnic strifes. Iran is a country of so many different um, ethnic minorities. We have Kurds, we have Arabs, we have Turkmens, uh, we have uh, Lors, Azeris, and many other ethnic uh, minorities living together. 
all of these groups and all of these uh, minorities are uh, being subject to their own um, challenges and restrictions. Um, some of them are underprivileged, uh, some of them are not represented in the top tier politics, but still they are living together. And so the country has been, uh, I mean, to some extent by virtue of its isolation, shielded itself from uh, some um, foreign threats, including foreign military intervention. And also um, the country is a very powerful military. So, um, I mean, thanks to some uh, domestic um, developments in the recent years, the country has been able to uh, deter some of the foreign threats posed to it militarily, but still uh, the isolation is not something that is negligible or inconsequential. Um, and uh, well, uh, the, the government is not able to, uh, for example, sustain meaningful relationships, even with many of its own close partners, um, because uh, the sanctions uh, that are still going on and have not been uh, eased are undermining its ability to uh, maintain robust trade with its trading partners. Um, and many of, I mean, even look at Russia and China, which are, which are Iran's security anchors uh, in the region. Uh, they are not prepared to go the extra mile to defy the US sanctions to do full-fledged trade with the Islamic Republic. Uh, even though there are limited um, um, quantities of trade going on, but still uh, Iran is not, for example, able to sell all of its um, petroleum and oil. Um, so the, a country that used to export more than 2.5 million barrels of oil per day after the nuclear deal was signed in 2015, is at the moment selling at maximum 700,000 barrels of oil per day. Mm. So imagine for a country that is oil dependent, the economy is uh, suffering a lot because um, the sanctions are um, basically uh, paralyzing the, the, the national economy. Uh, so a diverse country, a country of 85 million people, a country that has uh, great potentials, including its young people, who are active, dynamic, educated, and outward looking. Mm. This country is not able to tap into all of, all of its potentials and actualize its, it, uh, its potentials to uh, develop uh, in a number of ways, um, only because this ideology-driven battle of wills, including over Iran's nuclear program, is um, preventing it yeah. from uh, making progress. Well, um, uh, Koresh, I'll stay there. I know we're just going to take a very quick break um, here in the UK and we'll come back to you uh, very, very shortly. We're having uh, an important conversation about Iran, uh, the Middle East being in turmoil and what now uh, for the future uh, in terms of the Middle East? Because you've seen this global realignment in the Middle East. You've seen countries like the European United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, uh, who've established diplomatic relations with Israel and others like Saudi Arabia who've said they won't establish relations uh, until the Palestinian matter is resolved and that, that their freedom is given, um, are, are strengthening uh, diplomatic relations. So we'll talk about that as well, but also take your questions, 01924 231083. Uh, join us on the other side of these very important messages. They will be brief, I promise you, and we'll be back and we'll be taking your calls as well, but also uh, some comments coming through in social media. We'll share them as well. See you shortly. Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. We're having an exclusive conversation uh, with the Iranian journalist Koresh uh, Zibari, who's joining us, uh, not from Iran, he's in Turkey at the moment. Uh, really grateful, as always, that he has given us uh, his time this evening. Um, let's uh, just talk, uh, if we may, Koresh, about, you, you mentioned at the top of the programme, the, the interviewing uh, that you've done, the leaders that you've spoken to, the key policy makers, the movers and shakers in the diplomatic world, which guest has had the most profound impact on you that you've interviewed? So I have interviewed um, sitting and former presidents, prime ministers. One of the interviews that uh, was very appealing to myself was the interview I, I did with the Armenian president, Armen Sarkisian in Yerevan when I was there. 
a uh, couple of months after I published the interview, he resigned over um, his grievances about lack of constitutional authority to implement change in the country. Yet that was the height of tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict. Also, I recently conducted an interview with the president of North Macedonia, Stevo Pandorovsky, um, over um, and discussed the conflict in Ukraine, the Russian sanctions, um, and um, his country's reliance on Russia's energy exports. That was a conversation that I pretty much enjoyed. And um, I mean, there have been other interviews that I personally appreciate, uh, not just because of the opportunity, but because of the insights shared by the uh, interviewees and the um, actually dignitaries that I talked to. For example, I talked to Carl Bildt, the former prime minister of Sweden, about Iran's relations with uh, the European Union in the aftermath of the signing of the JCPOA. I talked to the former uh, director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Hans Blix, and um, also the former Polish president. Uh, uh, so, so many of these interviews um, uh, were done on um, the basis that I wanted to uh, explore uh, politicians' uh, views and uh, mindset about first relations with Iran, also a number of uh, side issues that pertain to Iran. Um, I guess a journalist uh, in a country like Iran, which is pretty much cornered and surrounded by isolation and loneliness these days, can have a great impact in cultivating a narrative and cultivating a dialogue the outside world. Um, so uh, if you seize a, a, the opportunity and if you uh, build on those opportunities to engage in dialogue and conversations, um, I guess that can contribute to a better understanding. So uh, I have talked to former um, U.S. Congressman uh, Jim Slattery when he visited Iran, actually, and he was one of the few um, former U.S. politicians and diplomats who traveled to Iran in the aftermath of the 1979 revolution. I talked to him back in 2013, 14, I guess it was. And that was a very enlightening conversation because of all the views he shared about his interest and his uh, willingness to see improved relations yeah. between Iran and the United States. So, um, um, it was just, I mean, yeah, these are all the conversations. That I yeah, had. so it's fascinating when you are able to talk to uh, as I said, uh, people who are uh, world leaders uh, in that aspect. Now, we see the nuclear talks uh, stall at the moment. Um, you know, there's a real possibility that they may collapse. We've seen Israel and Arab countries establish relations. How does uh, Iran see these developments? And are they fearful for what may happen if that nuclear deal uh, falls through? Um, I should say Iran's nuclear deal, the JCPOA, was a momentum that uh, was uh, actually kind of remodeling and transforming Iran's foreign relations. It was a, a non-proliferation deal, but uh, by the end of the day, it was also contributing to a fundamentally different uh, configuration of Iran's uh, foreign relations. So even Iran's relations with the Arab countries was kind of improving. Uh, Iran's trade with uh, its Arab neighbors in the Persian Gulf, it was improving. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, the former U.S. President Donald Trump's withdrawal, uh, it all unraveled. And uh, at the moment, there is no, uh, I mean, there is little hope that it can be revived because both uh, sides of the dispute, actually, Iran and the United States are refusing to pull punches and uh, make concessions that are needed to uh, uh, kind of resuscitate the deal. Um, the major sticking point, as we understand, is that Iran is asking the United States to take the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps from, um, remove the name of the IRGC from the foreign terrorist organizations list. The United States is refusing, and this is kind of leading to the kind of stagnation of the talks, but there might be other uh, fault lines that we are not aware of, we understand that uh, Russia might have its own uh, role in the stagnation of the talks uh, because uh, at the moment it's involved in a military conflict in Ukraine and it's trying to kind of extract compromises and concessions from yeah. the West. So that might be uh, 
that might be one of the reasons that actually um, the Turks have come to this current stalemate. Yeah. But uh, do, 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 the Iranians, do, the Iranian public. I was just sorry, I was just going to ask you about the Iranian public. Do you what, what's the reaction to the sense that the deal may or may not happen and Iran um, may still be under sanctions and isolation from the international community? Iranian people are pretty much uh, interested. They have a huge appetite for seeing the deal being revived because they understand this will uh, bring about a revived economy. This will alleviate much of their economic hardships and adversities, and that will possibly lead to their uh, renewed international integration. So when you talk to Iranian people on the streets, they are pretty much hoping that the deal can be restored, but uh, the prospects of the deal being uh, revived are thinning and are very bleak because of all the fault lines. Um, so, um, I mean, we are losing hope, but uh, still, uh, if the Raisi administration in Tehran is prepared to uh, take the concrete steps that are needed to resuscitate the deal, uh, and if it's uh, actually willing to embrace the uh, hard decisions that can uh, bring about the revival of the deal, including maybe, I mean, talking directly to the United States. Uh, that's what the Rouhani administration did in 2015, and uh, that contributed to the uh, signing of the JCPOA. At the moment, Iran and the United States are not on uh, talking terms. Uh, they are actually exchanging messages through the European Union. Uh, engagement in indirect talks is not going to be conducive to the national interests of Iran. Um, I guess uh, for the deal to be uh, finally done and for uh, both sides to back, actually go back into compliance with, uh, with, with the JCPOA, Iran and the United States, which are the major actually uh, parties to the deal and apparently are at odds over non-compliance should sit together, talk maturely uh, in a civilized manner, resolve the differences and make yeah. sure that for the benefit of Iran in the, the international community, the deal has been re-implemented. I was just going to ask you, um, the Middle East um, I blog has been reporting on, um, over the last few days that Iran has offered concessions uh, on the IRGC uh, terror. Uh, this is the Iranian Revolution Regard Corporation. Um, the the you know the, the the sanctions against them will be dropped um is, is that what you were hearing or is that significant um actually the listing of the rgc as a foreign terrorist organization is a major sticking point between iran and the united states uh i have read the report that iran has offered concessions but iranian authorities are uh, denying making that concession um, I guess uh, that continues to be a challenge um, and a roadblock to the revival of the deal. I'm not sure uh, if the Iranian government is prepared to just make sure that the nuclear deal is um, finalized, concluded, and then start a new round of negotiations with the United States over the delisting of IRGC as a foreign terrorist organization. So um, that's correct. Uh, there is this ongoing debate. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge debate. Um, RGC, uh, part of Iran's armed forces, was uh, blacklisted as a foreign terrorist organization by the Trump administration back in 2019. That was that didn't have anything to do with the nuclear deal. That mm. that's kind of an extra issue between the two countries. Yeah. And uh, the United States is saying that if Iran wants the uh, blacklisting to be uh, actually rescinded and repealed. It needs to come up with reciprocal steps on non-nuclear issues, but uh, we are not seeing that happening yeah. yet. Well, um, I think both sides are still talking uh, and hoping to get a, a, a result, uh, which is interesting. Uh, final question, what else are you working on in the future? Where, what else can we learn from you in the coming weeks and months? So uh, hopefully uh, I will be doing a, um, a fellowship with the United Nations to cover the UN General Assembly in September in New York City. Um, so uh, that's what I'm uh, anticipating. And also I'm working on a number of stories uh, on Iran's uh, foreign policy and um, uh, the Iranian society, and also starting a new round of uh, feature stories on Iran's culture and history for the new Arab publication based in London.
and uh, at the same time working on a book chapter. Uh, <laughs> so that's part of my academic contribution, but uh, all of these together are very time consuming, but hopefully I will be able to deliver um, of them. Yeah, well, um, it sounds like you've got a very busy life. Do you, what do you do to relax? Do you switch off? Do you do anything to relax? <laughs> uh, well, there's a little time to relax, but I try to, uh, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> well, you know what? You're in a beautiful city uh, of, uh, of um, Istanbul. So, uh, Koresh Zibari, the Iranian uh, journalist and broadcaster, thank you so much for joining us tonight here on British Muslim TV. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we reached our uh, end of our time there. Uh, talking to um, sorry, um, Zoresh Zebari about what's happening. And as I said earlier, those talks, uh, we understand, um, are potentially still going on. And it's going to be interesting to see how they develop, uh, because obviously you've got the dynamics on the ground changing. You've got some of those Gulf countries who have now established relationships with Ira uh, Israel, for example. Um, and then there's a wider concern around um, the involvement of uh, uh, the alleged involvement of Iran uh, in Yemen and in Syria um, and the relationship between that. And there are talks going on between the Saudis and the Iranians and the uh, UAE government and the Iranians as well. So there is, I would describe it as being complicated. You live in the same neighbourhood and you know that nobody's going to move out. Nobody can get away. You have to resolve issues. Right, what we're going to do after the break, we're going to head up to Scotland and the beautiful city of Glasgow and talk to Tariq uh, Mahmood, who is the founder of the Sufi Festival. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Uh, join us on the other side of these very important messages. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, live from our studios here in Wakefield. Uh, we're taking your calls on 01924 Get in touch with us on social media. The handle is British Muslim TV. Let's move on to our final story and guest. Now, Sufism uh, may be best described as Islamic mysticism, which through belief and practice helps Muslims attain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of direct personal experience of God. Now, while there are other suggested origins of the term Sufi, the word, is, the, sorry, the word is largely believed to stem from the Arabic word suf, which refers to the wool that was traditionally worn by mystics and pious people. Sufism is as relevant today in the Western world as it has been for centuries in the East. And according to Sufi groups, they have seen a revival among Western Muslims. Tariq Mahmood is a practicing Sufi uh, and based in Glasgow, in Scotland, and he set up the Sufi festival, which this year is returning back to the city, and it's happening on the 23rd and 24th of July, with a conference, Nasheed artists and scholars from around the world. Tariq Mahmood joins us live from Glasgow for this exclusive conversation here on British Muslim TV. Uh, Tariq Mahmood, salam alaikum, uh, welcome to British Muslim TV, excited to have this conversation. Wa alaikum salam, brother, mashallah, I'm really pleased to be here today, and uh, alhamdulillah, this opportunity is tremendous, I look forward to to be able to give information, share information with yourself and the audience today. Okay, I tried at the top uh, to give an explanation of what a Sufi is. How would you describe a Sufi to our viewers? Um, well, brother, one, one of the critical things is that um, part, part of the kind of objectives of, of our festival is about helping people understand that Sufism, there's really no distinction between Sufism and Islam. Um, you know, what, what you do have, of course, is a particular leaning uh, much more to the sort of intense spiritual direction in practice and life and, and, and affair, life affairs of people that practice for the uh, Sufi tradition more so. But one of the key messages that we're trying to give out to people is that Sufism is the essence and the soul of Islam. And if a person lives as a Muslim, um, true to the, the values of Islam, then in, in essence that they, they are a Sufi. The distinction might simply be that um, they are more inclined for the spiritual mm. class. Uh, that's broadly what I would say. Okay. Well, um, there, there, is, there is a connection between you and me. Uh, we, our grand sheikh, if you like, in Sufism are, are the same. Uh, it's the same from Mora Sharif, Khwaja Qasim Murvi, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, from Murray in Pakistan. You follow Nairi Sharif 
I'm in Gumgul Sharif. So we've got a spiritual connection. But where did your uh, interest in Sufism come from? Uh, my, my personal uh, story is interesting. I mean, ev everybody has a story, uh, uh, brother. The, the thing is, my, my particular story really started back in 2009. Uh, I, I went to perform Umrah back in 2009. And really, uh, you know, I was in my last day in Medina Sharif. And um, I was with a companion who, who himself was sort of inclined towards the Sufi tradition, whereas, whereas I wasn't. And in that um, evening, um, we had the pleasure and opportunity to actually meet somebody I, I was sort of I understood to simply be a holy person, really. I, I had no knowledge of this person. And in actual fact, that person was Hazar Pira Aldin Siddiqui Sabrem somebody who, who I had no prior knowledge about. And, and it, by a chance sort of encounter in Medina, the blessed city of the Prophet Sallallahu I met Hadar Pir Alauddin Siddiqui Sabirim Tulali. And, and in fairness, at that point, that's really sort of inspired um, my individual sort of um, journey, if you like, in this path. So that, that's where it sort of essentially came from. And uh, the rest is history, as, as they say. But you know, many things happened in between to help me learn a bit more about this path. And, and ultimately, you know, this, this sort of direction, if you like, came to me as a consequence of a, a hugely incredible, generous and kind personality in, 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 the, in the embodiment of Hadar Pira Laudin Siddiqui Sabrem Tulale. Yeah, um, he was the founder of New TV amongst many uh, other um, aspects in terms of uh, other religious organisations. Um, who sadly passed away a good few years ago. He had one of the largest funerals uh, in the UK. I was honoured uh, to attend. What 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 are the what sort of attributes did you see in him that 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 made you realise that he was the one that you wanted to get inspiration from and get close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? Well, the, the thing is, he us as in people born in the West, um, you know, we we have this perception around. You know, being cynical about people and and their people's objectives and, and the kind of true motivations leading behind why people do what they do. So what, one of the things for me personally, right at the beginning when I met, as I said, I met Bir Saab in, uh, in Medina Park, and and I sort of you know ignited a, a level of curiosity in my heart. So when I came here to the UK, and um, my my first thing was let me look into what this environment is all about. Let me have a look at this person and, and just give, get, get a sense of exactly what was going on. As I said, we, we, are a, we live in a bit of a cynical society. We sort of ask the question, why are people following certain people? And is there a kind of a ulterior motive behind that? And, and over the, the, the number of months that, you know, from Glasgow traveling down to Birmingham and sitting in the company of Bir Saab and generally the people around them, one thing I noticed was that there was an incredible um, attraction, you know, the, you know, almost like a moss towards light. You know, people were really surrounding uh, Ikabla Pirsa and, and they were doing it for, for, for just really that company and that presence. And there was nothing that I seen um, that would be questionable in terms of the motivation of, of this remarkable individual who simply was sharing love and kindness. Um, and the embodiment of Kalwa Pirsa and their personality was generosity, absolute generosity um, through through even even through their glance in terms of looking at individuals. And and you remarked, brother Shivik, about to the the funeral and and indeed it was one of the largest funerals certainly Birmingham has seen, possibly twenty thousand people, maybe more than that that attended that. And what one thing I you know I I had the honour and through very such sad occasion, but I had the honor to be there um, at that time. And, and one, one message I, I sort of took away from myself personally when I was leaving the, the funeral was that in actual fact, Kabla Pirsa's personality of generosity actually permeated the, the, the actual uh, funeral itself because in the funeral, and, and as Muslim, you know, we stand in a, in a Madhi Janaza, Salat al Janaza, and within the funeral, I actually seen um, what appeared to be non-Muslim people, mm -hmm. you know, Sikh people, um, um, white Scottish or English people, which certainly didn't appear to be directly Muslim. They may well be, uh, but they were standing in the funeral, and and that was simply the you know Hazrat Sab touched so many hearts that people simply wanted to be part of that. And one thing that I took away myself was actually 
the fact that Hadassa brought together so many people from different backgrounds, different communities, and they were sharing in that grief, that was even that at that moment, that was generosity by our shape because he actually gave it was giving something even at that point. Yeah. So and, 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 know, I would sum it up, sum it up as, as generosity. It's, it's yeah. probably the key word. I no, I was just gonna say and and the sense that Allah blessed the people of the United Kingdom that he could have got ill and he could have passed away in Pakistan and lots of thousands of people here in the UK would have been deprived from the honour of attending his funeral. Um, as I said, I had the honour of meeting him on many occasions, uh, very gracious, very respectful and very loving. And that's the unique thing about him, wouldn't you agree, uh, Brother Tariq, before we talk about the festival, is that everybody who had a relationship with him, whoever met him, even once, um, they would have nice things to say about him um, and uh, they would have, he would have had an impact on them in a really positive way. In, in, absolutely, there is there's no doubt about that. Uh, regardless of who you were, Muslim, non-Muslim, male, female, regardless of your cultural background, Hadassah have really um, exuded uh, radiance and 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 really that, that drew people to them. Um, and what guarantee without a shadow of a doubt, they touched people's hearts. Mm. They, they, there's a there's a saying by Mona Rumi Ramtulale that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm terrible sort of quoting quotes as such, but there's a, there's a saying that Mona Rumi says that, um, you know... And so, um, Bitsa was, uh, was known for his commitment and his lectures on Mona Jalaluddin Rumi. Oh, absolutely. Well, the, 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 there, there is a saying that Hazasab, Hazapir Aladdin Sikhsab Ramtulale, they revived the Dasri Masnavi, the, which is really the, the, the substantial um, written works of Mona Rumi Ramtulale, and they're renowned around the world for, for actually delivering those lectures, which have touched many people. Mm. And as I said, the, the reference I was trying to give in relation to Mona Rumi, the Mona Rumi in one of his sayings says that that uh, or alludes to the fact that the saints of God, the friends of God, they're like thieves. They take your heart, they steal it, and they, and, and they never fail in doing that because they're friends of the beloved God Almighty. And, and, and that encapsulates Hazar Sab. They actually stole your heart. And guess what? You didn't want it back because you gave it to them quite freely and willingly. Yeah. And Hazar Sab in, their, in some of their own lectures said, before you give your heart to your shape, you, uh, uh, before you give your hand to your shape, you actually give your heart. Allah and, 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 and that is those are the steps that have been taken. And many people that met Hazar Sab throughout their life, that's essentially what, what it was. So I have, um, you know, I'm truly honoured and privileged that, that I've had the opportunity to have had that experience in my life. Yeah, well, per, per, thank you so much uh, for the honour of uh, letting us spend a few moments remembering uh, such an extraordinary individual, and uh, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates his rank in Jannah. Uh, so, it is, you know, that spiritual connection, that's where your connection with Sufism started. Where did the idea of this festival, the Sufi festival, come from? Okay, so the, the festival in itself, I mean, often, and relatively, you'll know this, no doubt, um, generally, when we experience the kind of uh, public perception or the wider perception, uh, certainly through some media narratives, Muslims are often presented in a very negative uh, light, you know, often presented, um, you know, terrorists, God forbid, um, or generally unhappy people. That's probably a, a good way to put it. Unhappy people uh, wanting to take over the world, unhappy with the fears of life. And actual fact, that, that can be further from the truth. Of course, every society, every single community out there has, you know, people that simply are counterproductive to good relationships, good uh, community, um, and, and, and coming together. Um, and... and However, we, we know no doubt know this that often the negatives are uh, you know picked up on and amplified. So myself and a number of colleagues back in 2017, as, as a matter of fact, that's sort of when the very early days these ideas were being formulated. Said, look, let, let's present true, authentic, traditional Sufi Islam uh, as it is, as it's uh, practiced as, as a matter of fact, something that mm. is authentic and share it with the world. And let that beauty shine through and permeate. And let's see where we're saying. Um, sorry, Tariq, just stay there. We're just going to have to take a very quick break. Uh, I promise you we'll come back to you. We're having an exclusive conversation with the founder of the Sufi Festival, uh, which is happening this year in Glasgow on um, the 23rd and 24th of July. And the founder, Tariq Mahmood, sharing his thoughts. We'll take a very quick break. We'll come back and we'll continue the conversation. See you shortly.
Asalaamu Alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. My special guest is Tariq Mahmood, uh, who is still with us live on British Muslim TV from Glasgow. Let's open the lines and take some of your calls if you've got a question on Sufism or questions about the festival. 01924231083, what impact? So, um, you were just talking just before the break about the concept uh, of the festival. What impact do you think Sufism can have in bringing people and communities together? It's, 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 uh, I, think, I think it could be a tremendous, and in, in fact, the experience of over 2019 festival is a very much a testament that actually you can bring communities together through something which is ex incredibly uh, positive. Um, back in 2019, uh, Brother Shafiq, we, we attracted about 40% of, of the people that attended the Sufi festival were from a non-Muslim background. Um, and and is, you know that that probably far exceeded any expectation that we had. And so the question is, why why did that happen? So uh, first and foremost, from our perspective, as in the team that devised the project, it's about presenting something which is is not preaching. You know, it's not saying do this, do that, and if you don't do this, you don't fit into the the the, the sort of category of being acceptable. Uh, Sufism doesn't mean that there aren't standards. It doesn't mean that there isn't, um, you know, a sort of a standard by which, you know, people should be who uh, they are in, in accordance with the, the Quran and Sunnah and, and the Hadith of our beloved Prophet and, and following the Sunnah. But what it, what it does say is that, look, you know, in the end of the day, li life is about living and engaging with one another to, to experience each other to then decide whether this thing is for you or not. So from our perspective, the Sufi Festival has, has, has taken a very non-judgmental approach and, and looked to try be trying to become very inclusive, letting everyone and anyone who wishes to come and engage, come along, participate. And, and traditionally, the, the history tells us that the Sufi tradition was about you know, communities going out, um, uh, or Sufi individuals going out within communities and presenting themselves through their etiquette, through their character. So I think there's a, a, there's a lot to be said in terms of presenting traditional Islam and letting people experience that for themselves and then take a decision whether it's of interest. And also it's important not to put up barriers. You know, um, th there are very, very few opportunities to engage with wider population, wider communities. And, um, you know, yes, we have the, the mosque, um, uh, you know, tools that, that the, the mosque do, do, you know, do put a lot of time and effort in organizing. Mm. We have open the stars, bringing communities together to break fast. Yeah. However, from a cultural experience point of view, there's very little that takes place out there. And the Sufi Festival does allow that experience to happen. Yeah. Um, and it must take a lot of planning and activity and work to put such a festival together. It, it does, 100%. It does. Um, it, the 2019, 2019 festival, the planning commenced in um, late 2017. Wow. And, and, and we delivered the festival in, in July 2019. So you're talking about a year and a half um, or, or certainly short of almost two years. And um, we felt this time around, or, or at least back in uh, 2019, um, as we were, we were actually planning a festival in 2020, and sadly due to COVID, we were unable to do that. So we kind of felt, we having done it previously, it, it would be a lot easier, um, but, but, it, but it isn't. It, it, it actually isn't because this time around, what we've actually done is we've we've kind of diversified it and added different elements to the project. And in actual fact, it's probably taken us a lot more. But I can certainly say, as soon as you're literally finishing off one festival uh, within weeks, you're starting to plan the following one. So it takes a lot of time and preparation, especially if you want to do it justice. You know, it's about the quality of the content, the quality of the proposition, and uh, and making sure that you know, it, it, it does reflect those kind of values that, that are inherent in Sufism, which is of beauty and um, love and commitment. And we want that to be as part of the festival as much as we possibly can do our best to deliver. So you've got a visual art exhibition. Tell us a bit about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we have a number of visual art exhibitions. And um, notably, we, we have invited uh, a fairly accomplished uh, photographer, from, uh, photographer uh, Brother Omar from Istanbul. Uh, Brother Omar has, has over the past 30 years spent uh, 30 years uh, photographing 
the willing dervishes um, across this Istanbul in genuine techies, um, in, in gen, genuine Mevlevi order uh, techies across Istanbul. And he's going to be basically exhibiting his uh, exhibition of 30 years with photography of different dervishes across, uh, uh, across Istanbul. We hopefully will also be inviting, or we have extended the invitation um, to one of the dervishes to come and, and, and deliver Sema as part of the exhibition itself, inshallah. Uh, so, sorry, Sema for, for your viewers is, is willing, um, the willing practice itself. So we're hoping that the exhibition will be accompanied with actual willing practice alongside that. So that's one of the exhibition that we have and it's taking place in a, a beautiful, uh, serene gallery space in the tramway, which is our venue in Glasgow. Um, we also have uh, an artist called Nadia, um, who, uh, you know, she's a remarkable watercolor artist. She's exhibiting at the, uh, at the exhibition. Uh, and thirdly, there's a, there's a very interesting uh, art gallery based in Bradford called Artside. And, and they have an exhibition as well. So we've got three fantastic exhibitions of different art forms, photography to watercolor to print. So yes, we, we have a whole range of things for, for people to look at and admire and look at the kind of beauty of, of the artistic representation of the Islamic culture. Uh, so far and nice lots. And you've got some sessions, you've got a conference, you've got speakers, you've got Nasheed artists who are also joining us. Tell a bit about that. Yes, absolutely. Well, overall, Brother Shafiq, we've got somewhere in the region of about 40 activities taking place over the two days. Oh, the, the, this year, the exhibition or the festival as a whole will commence on Saturday, the 23rd of July. Uh, starting at three o'clock to half past seven, we have a conference. We're calling it the Sufi Conference. We have two significant speakers, Sheikh uh, Ninui, uh, from, originally from Aleppo, Syria, uh, now based in Georgia, coming in from the States to actually deliver um, a, a speech or, or, or a talk for our audiences attending that. We also have Sheikh Ahmed Saad, um, who is based in Birmingham, now based in Birmingham, originally from London. But both of these sheikhs are fairly eminent scholars. Um, they are Sayyids, they, are, uh, they have a lineage for, from our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And and they're very um, you know they're orators they they, they they can they can deliver um, content and and they can, it, it would be impactful. They are Sufi of a Sufi tradition as well. So coupled with the, the scholarly position, they are of a Sufi tradition, which actually gives that extra soul to the delivery. And on the Sunday we have these two scholars. And closing off the conference, we'll have a fantastic Nasheed group called Love's Pilgrim, based in London, classically trained. And they will be delivering the sheets um, in, in both in English and and also in, in, in the traditional languages as well. So that that's our composition for mm. Saturday. On Sunday, as I said, we have four activities. Probably most of them will be on Sunday, ranging from nasheed poetry, and um, we've we've got artists such as Ahmed the Class, a dub poet, remarkable. He every time I listen to him, really it just sort of brings joy in your heart. We have, um, you know, a whole range of artists that I'm trying to think, where do I start and where do I finish? But mashallah, we've got a range of things. We have whirling dervish workshops. We have uh, um, a master coming in from Holland with a number of dervishes, and he'll be walking through that process. We've got creative art workshops. Um, we've got a fantastic theatre group called Khayal Theatre, who will be delivering a range of things. Um, Sister Jamana Moon is a fantastic storyteller, um, really wonderful at the, the art form that she delivers. Um, so we've got a huge range of things. The event itself, Brother Shafiq, it's, it's taking place at a venue uh, which is both indoor and outdoor. Outdoor, we have marquees erected, family areas, food, stalls, sort of, you name it, we've tried to accommodate that. Um, but wherever possible, we are hoping that, inshallah, there's going to be everything for all ages and all, all, all age groups as well. Um, sort of to top up, Top off, if you like, the evening, uh, on Sunday evening, we're actually holding a uh, Gwali um, event starting at half past seven, going on to 11 p.m. So it's a fairly intense, beautiful opportunity to immerse yourself in very Sufi-orientated music and art form. So we have that sort of topping up, uh, topping through or, or sort of bringing the finale to the overall event uh, uh, over the course of the two days, mashallah. So many, many things to do. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, British Muslim TV is the official media partner. How can our viewers sample a festival from the comfort of their own homes? 
Well, first of all, I'd say I, I would encourage viewers to come to the festival because there's nothing like uh, physically being there and experiencing things on hand. Um, I, I know for sure that there's people throughout the UK that are, are, are certainly coming along. Um, however, of course, you know, we want to make it accessible to everyone and, and many people might not be able to travel up from different parts of the world. So, so I believe um, colleagues will have the, the, the festival broadcast uh, on channel Sky Channel 752. Um, it will also air on your social media platform for BMTV. Um, they may also be a feed directly onto the Sufi Festival um, social media platforms as well. So, as I said, first of all, I would encourage you to take that leap. You know, you know, if you've never been to Scotland, let this be your first and most unique excuse to come to Scotland. It's a beautiful country. Glasgow is a beautiful people, a beautiful city with beautiful people. But of course, you can't make it, mashallah. BMTV, as our media partners, uh, Alhamdulillah, which we're very grateful for and, and we value this relationship, will we'll certainly be making it available through online platform as well as a broadcast live on BMTV or on Sky. Yeah. And, and I suppose, well, very quick, briefly, um, 90 seconds left, but probably got about 30 seconds. Um, how can people find out more about the festival? Okay, so we have a fantastic website, www.sufifestival.org. Um, everything that you need to learn about this, pro, uh, this festival during the weekend is there. You can book, book tickets through that. There's a big massive okay. button to book tickets. And of course, the program is there for you to look at. Well, thank you so much uh, for being my special guest this evening. Really looking forward to maybe welcoming you back after the festival to review how it went. And as you said, uh, British Muslim TV is the official media partner. Tariq, I'm looking forward to maybe pop up as well, inshallah, and, and uh, if I get a chance to come up as well. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Inshallah. If you're home, brother, more than welcome to you. Thank you so much. Allah bless you. Uh, so we reached the end of another program. First, I want to thank our special guest tonight, Tariq Jamal from the Pillar app, Quresh Zibari, the Iranian journalist uh, joining us uh, from Turkey, and Tariq Mahmoud there, the founder uh, and the inspiration behind the Sufi festival. Thank you so much. Next week, we're taking the night off due to the charity appeal for Qurbani here on British Muslim TV. We'll be back the week after. Uh, have a great weekend. Enjoy the weather wherever you are around the world. Have a great weekend. Thank you to the team behind the scenes here in the studios at uh, Wakefield. From me, Mohammed Shafiq, and the whole team here at British Muslim TV, thank you so much for joining us. Take care of yourself and each other, and I'll see you very, very soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.